Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. That's what we've been talking about. The shadow of things to come. The types and shadows in the Old Testament and even those some in the New Testament that Jesus uh, tells us our future through. And we've been going over some last week. We're going to continue that tonight. Man, where do you stop? I, we're just going to have to stop at some point. I think next week we'll go into God's timeline. That way people that haven't studied that one can kind of see what to watch for there, and then we'll probably end it next week and, unless there's something else that y'all want us to cover. I titled tonight's Shadow of Things to Come, part two, real original. My subtitle is Shadows in the Desert. We're going to go to Exodus. There is so much in the book of Exodus that we cannot cover it all because I know I haven't seen it all. And that's what's fun about this study is hopefully it starts y'all wanting to read the Old Testament again, look for New Testament truths in it, and then y'all see things that I read right over. And that's, that's my hope, and you know I always want to know what you know. So <laughs> go with me, Colossians 2. We started off with this scripture last week. It's been our basis of our study. Colossians 2.16, I'm reading now the Amplified. It says, Therefore let no one sit in judgment on you in matters of food and drink, or with regard to a feast day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath. Such things are only the shadow of things that are to come, and they have foreshadowed the body of it. I'm sorry, I skipped. They have only a symbolic value, but the reality, the substance, the solid fact of what is foreshadowed belongs to Christ. It's all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, that's what they just sang. It is all about Jesus. Now, we touched on this last week but because we have a few people here this week that weren't here last week. Let me just say, why is this important for us to study? First of all, to me, it shows us the brilliance of God and the faithfulness to his word. When he pictures something in the Old Testament, he has the power and the way to bring what he pictured in the Old Testament into a New Testament truth. He brings the reality. If I can be that sure of his word with a serpent on a pole, I can be that sure of his word that by his stripes I'm healed. It, it's all connected. And that is... This is a beautiful witnessing tool, too. If people think the, the Bible's not relevant, just start talking about types and shadows. Just bring up the subject. You wouldn't believe what we studied at church the other night. This is so fascinating. No man could write this book. This is a great witnessing tool. The second thing that I really like about types and shadows is it helps me to double-check my thinking. It helps me to double-check doctrine, if you will. You know, is healing for us today? Can we go back and find it? Uh, is the Holy Spirit and, and speaking in tongues, is that for us today? Can I go back and find it? So if I can find a type and shadow, that helps me put confidence in what I'm thinking, if it's right or wrong. So that's, that's a great reason. We've used Psalms 40, verse 7. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to refer to it. And also Hebrews 10, 7 last week, where the scripture says, In the volume of the book it is written of me. We are always to be looking for Jesus and what he provided for us in everything that we read. That is the whole purpose for the scripture being here. And I don't know about you, but I love good Bible story. I grew up on Bible stories. I, I read my grandbaby's Bible stories. But this isn't just a book about history. We can see our life in those stories. That makes them relevant, not just history, but it makes it relevant to our present and to our future. So with that, go to Exodus 3, and you'll just want to put a ribbon in Exodus because we'll be spending quite a bit of time in the wilderness <laughs> tonight. There's just so much there. You're going to have fun going back and reading this and seeing things that we're not even going to cover tonight. Exodus 3, I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm reading out of the King James Version. 
Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. That's going to be the meat of, of this point right there. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw nigh hither, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place where on your standing it is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into a good land, and a, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of all the ites. That's easier than me reading all those Hittites and all those Jebusites and all those ites. So this bush, a literal bush, is on fire. God speaks through it, but the bush is not consumed. This has to be a type of the New Testament believer Filled with the Holy Spirit. It just has to be shadowed here. Just think about the day of Pentecost. Think about the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. If you want to flip over there, you can, or I can just read it to you. But in Acts 2, I know you all know this, but we, no, we can't say that. We don't. <laughs> we always got to look. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Flames. Something that looked like flames on each one of them. Yet they were not consumed. And then what happened? God spoke through them. God speaking through man. Anytime you see fire in the Old Testament, look to see if it fits the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't, leave it alone. But if it does, you're fixing to learn something about Holy Spirit and His work. So, in chapter 4, it, when you're reading this, you're just going to get so excited because every chapter there's something with Moses. But in chapter 4, he has a rod. You remember, God's sending him into Egypt to deliver the, the children of Israel from the slavery of Pharaoh. And he has this rod. He's, he's like, God, how, how am I going to go? Who am I to go? I can't. I, I talk with a I stutter. And he says, okay, I'll send Aaron with you. And he says, how are they going to know that I'm from God? And he said, you see that rod in your hand? Do you remember this story? You see that rod in your hand? That was his, the, the word that, of God that gave him the authority and that gave him the confidence to go and do what God told him to do. If he had that rod, he could do miraculous things. It wasn't a special rod. It's what God told him. It was the, his rod. He already had the rod. It wasn't doing any miracles. But when God put his word on it, something special happened. And so that's the way God does us. We could be ordinary life. But when God puts his word on it, folks, then you can go in confidence and you can go in authority to do what he's called you to do. And so he, if you remember, he cast the rod down on the ground. God says, cast the rod down on the ground. Now, I don't like this part, Cheshire, but it became a serpent. <laughs> God would surely use a dove or something with me, but it becomes a serpent. And God says, okay, pick it back up again. And so he grabs it by the tail and he picks it back up, and it becomes a rod again. No doubt in my mind that's a type of Jesus. 
you know, the, the authority, the, the confidence, the call, and then he comes, he becomes the serpent. We're going to talk about the serpent on the pole. Uh, he becomes sin for us, and then he's made whole again and, and replaced in his place in glory. So this is a type of Jesus. It's a type of Jesus who is the word. We know that giving us authority to speak, um, Jesus coming in the flesh, becoming sin, becoming the rod again. And I didn't pick those scriptures out for you. I just said chapter 4 because it pretty well goes through the whole thing. Then there comes this time where there's this showdown. I mean, a showdown with Pharaoh's magicians and Moses and Aaron. And who's, who's God here? Who really, who really has the power here? And so when this happens, Aaron takes the rod... And he throws it down. The sorcerers have thrown down their rods, and they've become serpents, which we know is just trickery. They were magicians. But Aaron and Moses' rod eats his serpent. Their serpent eats all the sorcerers' serpents. And I like what you've heard this joke for years. King snake. King snake. Jesus. Oh, yeah, the devil's got stuff. It's all tricks. It's all tricks. The true will eat them up, and indeed he did. He defeated the enemy. I, I love that one. I couldn't pass that one in chapter 4, even though it's not one of our major subjects of the night. I love that one. In a couple of weeks, we'll cover the Passover lamb. It, it's going to have to be covered on its own night. Easter's coming. It'll be a great time to cover that one. But let's go on over to Exodus 15. This is a small one, but these small ones are... I like the way Dad used to do this. Now, we're all computerized now, but I think most of us in here are old enough to remember when we didn't have that privilege. And Dad would bring these... Um, do y'all remember projectors? Okay. And, and you remember, what do you call that clear? Transparency. There's people in here my age. Transparencies. And y'all remember Dad doing this? he would have a picture of somebody. And it would be in layers. He would call it a composite drawing. And like the policeman would take, if you were trying to identify somebody, and, and you would ask the person, is it this nose or that nose? Is it these eyes or those eyes? And then they would layer them, and when they got it all layered, they would have a picture of what that person looked like. And that's the way Dad would always, we don't have a projector to use anymore for me to use that example. Dad would always use that to show that each one of these little things, knowing the ark, manna, the rod, the bread, the living water, Joseph, David, all of these Bible stories contain a sheet in that layer that in the Old Testament from Genesis forward starts making a picture until Christmas morning when that word is born. That's what we're doing. We're looking for him in every layer. I see Jesus there. Oh, that's just a little tidbit of information, but I, I see Jesus in that rod. I see Jesus in that serpent on the pole. I see Jesus in the water. Let's look at Exodus 15. Verse 22. The people were thirsty. There was no water. And they came upon Mara. But they couldn't drink the water because the water was bitter. In fact, Mara means bitterness. It means angry. Mankind could not be satisfied. They could find no peace. They could find nothing to quench their thirst. The waters were bitter. Verse 23 says, And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What are we going to drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him 
a tree. Now, anytime you read something and it doesn't make sense, please pay attention to it. Because God's probably trying to picture something here for us. No man's thirst could be quenched. The waters were bitter. That also means angry. Man could not be satisfied. Who, how are we going to get satisfied, Father? What are we going to do to be satisfied? God shows him a tree. Could that be the cross? Of course. God shows him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Taking away the bitterness, taking away the anger, and making it sweet, life-giving water. I love these little things. Then in Exodus 16, we see manna. Everybody knows, everybody knows the story of manna coming, bread falling from heaven, right? Everybody know what manna means? It means what is it? That's what the word means. What is it? These guys are going out, God's, you know, tossing rolls, and these guys see it, and they're, they're like, what is it? So they name it manna, which means what is it? So everyone gathered, you can read this, it takes quite a while, but everyone gathered the manna according to his eating. This is us, this is us getting the word. You took what you needed, okay? According to his eating. It was to be gathered daily. It, you couldn't live off yesterday's manna. You got to have fresh manna, folks. We got to have fresh word. We can't live off what we heard when we were 15. We, we've got to have fresh manna. If they kept it, worms would develop in it. I know, it's hard to think about ruining a good bread, but worms would develop in it. It would be eaten up with worms. It, they could not live off of old manna. I love that. On the sixth day, we're going to get into next week's lesson if I'm not real careful. But on God's timeline, sixth day could, could mean the 6,000th year uh, from the beginning. They were to get a double portion. They were to load up. Why? Because the, seventh, the Sabbath was coming and they were not to gather it on the Sabbath. The day of rest was coming when they would not gather the manna. So... We'll get into that probably next week on the timeline. Verse 31 tells us that this manna tasted like wafers made with honey. Why would he even tell us what it tasted like? Probably because in Psalm 119, 103, he talks about how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's Psalm 119, 103. Well, sure. That's why he told us it tasted like wafers with honey. Because the psalmist had already penned that his word was like honey to his lips. Manna was no doubt a type of Jesus, the sustaining word. His word to us that would sustain us, that we needed to partake of it daily. It came from God and from God alone. Now, I don't have this in my notes, so I'm going to flip over there to John chapter 6. Comes after Luke. <laughs> I was going the wrong direction. Y'all, I still use my tabbies, so y'all don't feel bad if y'all use those little tabs on the side of your Bibles. Especially if I'm looking for those minor prophets. <laughs> Some of them only have one page. They're a little hard to find, so don't ever feel bad. If you're looking for the Word, don't feel condemned. John 6, verse 32. Well, let's go up to 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, Give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, he just pretty well told us that that type is true. It is him. He is the bread 
from heaven. He is the manna. It pictures something about him. So you might want to do a little more digging and studying on that. And then you remember in, from our study of the book of Revelation when we did it verse by verse, in Revelation 10 verse 9, John is told to eat the little book. Eat it. it. That has to be the word of God. It, it has to be the word. He said, you take it and you eat it, and it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Manna was a type and shadow of Jesus, the sustaining word. Go with me to Exodus 17. You know, there's so many truths that you could rabbit trail off of. We could do a whole message on the manna. But people who aren't satisfied aren't partaking of the word. It, it, it is the only thing that will bring that soul satisfaction to us. It was built in, into us to need the word. And so that's, that's when we get that satisfaction. A lot of people, all of us, have looked for it in different places, but it comes from the word. Exodus 17. Oh, I love this one. We're going to spend some time on this one. Verse 3. We're in the wilderness. Moses is leading them. We're trying to get to the promised land. They're in rebellion. We're wandering around. It says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. They, they murmur a lot. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They're about to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, we talked about before, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock at Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now that rock was a type of Jesus. It was a type of Jesus with living water. We know this for a fact. If you'll hold your place there and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is talking about the deliverance of the children of Israel. You'll notice he's showing you other types here. Anytime you see that, uh, that he compares something, pay attention because you can go back and study that type. And he's telling you right here a type. He said, how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Huh? When you see something strange, pay attention. Did you, did you hear what I just said? For they drank out of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, I love what Dad says. This doesn't necessarily mean that a boulder followed them. Okay? But wherever they needed water, there was the rock. I love that. See, when you read something strange and, and that catches your attention... Pay attention to it because he's trying to tell us something. So he, it says that rock was Christ. That word rock, guess which word that is? Petra. Petra. Not Petros, Petra. Do you remember the difference between the two? Petra is that large foundational rock. Petros is what he called Peter in Matthew 16, 8 when he said you are Peter Petros. Little rock off the big rock. Your, your little rock. 
but I am the rock. I am the Petra, the rock, the founding stone, the cornerstone. And upon this Petra rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He is that rock in, in Exodus 17. He is that rock in Matthew 16, 8. That is who he is. Exodus is simply a type and shadow of him. Now we see Act 2 of this story in Numbers 20. So flip over to Numbers 20 because there's a very important truth here that we all need to be reminded of no matter how many times we've heard this. Numbers 20, verse 8. Same things happen. People are thirsty. They're crying out for water. We're thirsty again. And he says, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and do what? Okay, the first time we're to smite the rock, John, this time we're to speak. It's a New Testament truth. This is the faith message, type and shadowed in the Old Covenant. Speak unto the rock before their eyes. Listen to this. And it shall give forth his water. Not its water. His water. This is how important the words of the word are. We can't just read over this. In fact, if I hadn't have found Dad's old Bible school notes, I would have read right over that for you tonight because I forgot about it. And I was just reading, and I, I was going to the speak to the rock. Don't smite it the second time. That's where my mind was going. And if I had not taken the time to go back over old notes, I would have read right over that myself. We've got to pay attention to the words of the Word because they are layers so speak to the rock before their eyes. It shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, <laughs> Oh, this is a great pastoral moment. <clears throat> You rebels, do I have to get this water for you out of this rock again? He's frustrated. These people are murmuring. He's thinking, I've done this for you before. I've told you this before. I've told you this before. I've, I have to get the same water out of the rock again. So he gets mad. He gets in the flesh, so to speak. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Mm-mm. One time for Jesus. Salvation was complete the first time he was smitten. Now we speak. We don't ask Jesus to do things again. We don't ask him to be sacrificed again. We don't ask him to do what he has already completed and done in the work of salvation. We don't smite the rock twice. Water came out abundantly. God still took care of the congregation. And the congregation drank and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, and he said, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now this seems tough. Moses has left. He has faced Pharaoh. He's had showdowns. And we've gone through the plagues. We've gone through all these things. And Moses has been faithful. And in this one instance, now he doesn't get to finish leading these people into the promised land. Why is that so severe? Don't mess with the top. He messed with the top. Joshua's going to have to come in and lead the people in to the promised land. He would then become the top. Joshua would then become the top. God took care of Moses. Don't worry about Moses. He was well, well taken care of. Believe not, enter not. That's the faith message. Believe not, enter not. You can't enter into the promises if you don't believe. The provision of salvation was complete in Jesus. 
So don't smite him again. Stop asking Jesus to do what he has already done. Jesus, touch them. Now, healing's complete. It's up to them to believe and to receive. Jesus, come down and... No, no. He came down. He's been spent one. Anytime we strike the rock twice, we X ourselves out of the promise. Just as Moses did. So I love that Numbers 20 is Old Testament type of the faith message of the New Testament. We speak. We speak to the rock. We speak. Go with me to Romans 10. Don't forget, hold your place in Exodus. Romans 10, verse 4, I'm reading out of the NIV. Jumping in the middle here. Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. That's the way the law operated. But the righteousness that is of faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? What does this word of faith say? It says the word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Sozo. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Numbers 20. That's, that's, that's Numbers 20 in the New Testament right there. Numbers 20 is that verse in the Old Testament. They go together. The rock has been smitten. John 19, 34. I'll just read it to you. I'm just going to read one verse unless you're quick. John 19, 34. Out of the Amplified, it says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came and flowed out. The rock has been smitten once. Now we speak. Great, great type and shadow. The water that came out of him would be living water. What kept the children of Israel and Moses out of the promised land was not the enemy. It was unbelief. What keeps me out of the promises is not the devil. It's not the enemy. It's unbelief. It's the only thing that can stop me from inheriting the promise is unbelief. And this place that God promised them, what we call the promised land, was not a type of heaven. There's a lot of old songs that my granny and crew used to sing that talked about prom the promised land being heaven. When they cross over Jordan and they, you know, they get into heaven, then Lisa, you probably remember some of those good old country gospel songs that then they would receive the promises. But wait a minute, that type doesn't fit. Because in the promised land that God promised Moses and the children of Israel, what was there? The enemy. You're not going to have an enemy in heaven. The promised land is a type of the new covenant life. The life of the believer living in what God has promised him. And yes, there is an enemy there trying to stop you. But God can take care of the enemy. He just needs you to step across. He needs you to take the land. He'll work out. There's, there's scriptures about God driving out the enemy with hornets. That'll work. I think I've said this before, but it doesn't matter how big the giants are. If there's a hornet... God has a way of taking care of the enemy. The enemy is defeated. God needs us to have faith enough to, to take the land that he has promised us. And what a beautiful type the promised land was of the covenant life that God's given to us. All right. Ooh. Go with me quickly to Numbers 21. We're still wandering around out in the wilderness. 
Yeah, most theologians believe it was about an 11 day journey, if that, from where they were enslaved to the promised land, and it took them 40 years. So let's not take that long to receive our healing. Let's not take that long to walk in the ministry of reconciliation or whatever ministry God has called you into. Let's not take that long. Uh, let's, let's head to the promise. Amen? Numbers 21. This is a beautiful one. Verse 6. Y'all are going to cringe as soon as I read these first words. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. You can go to Deuteronomy 8.15 and it'll tell you that there were fiery serpents in the wilderness already. Deuteronomy 8.15, you can reference that. But they're in rebellion, so of course the serpents are going to show up. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bid the people, and much people of Israel died. Remember, this is a nation we're talking about here. This is a lot of people. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And a lot of people do this. This is top and shadow, but a lot of people do this. God, take this from me. Take this from me. You remember, I think I remember somebody in the Bible asking uh, three times for the Lord to take something from him, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. You take care of this. You take authority over this. So that's what they're doing. Take the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord, this is the answer. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and he put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he had beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now let's just pick out a, a few key things here. They wanted the serpents taken away. This is how you defeat the enemy in your life. He had Moses make a fiery serpent, which is a type of Jesus on the cross with your sin nature. If you can't see Jesus on the cross with your personal sin nature, then you're never going to be able to defeat the effects of the enemy. So he made it out of brass. Brass in the Bible typically symbols judgment of sin. Okay? So he had him make it out of brass. He put it on a pole, which was the cross. I would like to see what that pole looked like, wouldn't you? I just have a strange feeling it was, it was cross-shaped. If a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass... He lived. I like verse 8 because it says when he looketh upon it. This continual looking. And, and you've got to put your, yourself in these guys' sandals, so to speak. These are fiery serpents. They're not called fiery for no reason. Now, this is a painful bite, Lindsay. I don't like snakes to start with, but you give me one that has a painful bite, and they're crawling across my feet, and the person to my left just fell over dead, and the person to my right just fell over dead. And God says, uh-uh, don't you look. This business is going down, going broke. This business is going broke. This marriage is failing. That marriage, don't, mm, mm My husband's doing this, fishing or something. My wife's doing this, going to Branson shopping. I, whatever, God says, no. No, if you don't want the effect of the serpent's bite, you don't take your eyes off of that pole. You don't take your eyes off of the cross. If you take your eyes off the cross, then the effects of the serpent's bite will show up in your life. But no matter what the serpent does, no matter what the serpent does, you keep your eyes on the cross and you'll live above any powers that he has or anything that he's pulled in your life. And haven't we all lived that one? Keep our eyes on it. Keep our eyes on what Jesus did for us and the effects of the serpent. They'll have no power in us. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The effects of the devil do not have to reign in my life. John 3, verse 14 I'm having to hurry. I apologize. Jesus is speaking. John 3, 14. It says, And as 
Remember, that's an important phrase. When you see as, he's fixing to show you a top and shadow. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth, looketh, in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Man. Old Testament is alive. It's alive in New Testament lives. And we can study it and we can find things there. I can't hardly wait till next week. This is such a fun study. And I've studied and I've heard my dad teach it for 30 years. And I get excited about it all over. Rusty said I might have got a little too excited last week. I was a little wound up last week. But boy, when you get back into this stuff again, it just makes you want to go back and just take the time to read Read the word. Read it and look for Jesus. Amen? Y'all can stand. Man, I got to reading about, we probably won't cover this one next week, so I'll slide it in. Dessert. I got to reading about Jericho. You know, Moses couldn't go in to the promised land. Joshua took over. He's taken the children of Israel the enemy's there. They've got fortified cities. They've got walls. And Jericho's the first city that they were to conquer when they went into the promised land. And there's a type of tithe in there. There's a type of the tithe in there because it was the first fruits of the conquered cities. Uh, Jericho was the first. They couldn't take any of the gold and silver or jewels, John. That was the Lord's. Is tithing for the New Testament church? I don't know. Is there a type of it in the Old Testament? Yes, there is. If it's the first, it's God's. This word is amazing. Read it. Do do what he told John. Eat it. Eat it up, and it'll be honey on your lips. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.